Welcome back to our 20th Reddit Deep Dive episode. Like always, I want to give a special shout out to our channel members, but you can also support the channel by simply subscribing and leaving a like. As a warning, some of the posts in this episode are graphic. Viewer discretion is advised. Now that that's out the way, let's dive in. Our first post comes from the user Violent Cupcake and was posted over seven years ago on September 9th of 2016. Boyfriend got an odd text about a month ago. Yesterday he found a note on his truck relating to it. So over a month ago, my boyfriend got an odd text in the middle of the night. The first text was weird enough, but he just thought it was a friend messing with him who had a little too much to drink so the next morning, he sent the text back. This is how that conversation played out. What an entrance which was made. Who is this? And why did you text me in the middle of the night? Only saying to you, Welcome, Mr. Whichever one of the two of you is, whoever you and the other male, that's maybe, if not you. Who is this? Tucker, here I am. Now send me. Got cut short there. Now send me your photograph. Stop contacting me. I'm blocking your number. I understand everything clearly, even leaving unblocked. Guaranteed that it is certain for sure you'll not get texted nor called by me. So this is final text and good night, Tucker. The weird thing is, he kept using my boyfriend's first and last name. Also, we were able to figure out that that picture is of Tucker Max, an author. He didn't hear anything from this goon after the last message on the 21st of July. That changed yesterday. So my boyfriend heads out to work to find an envelope with his name and our address written on it, on the windshield of his truck. Inside was a folded piece of paper. Here's what he found when he unfolded it. For Mr. Hello. Best regards. Tucker. Once again, first and last name. And the backside. It's the same thing as the last text he got on the 21st. He did the smart thing and called the cops. They are looking into it and told him if anything else weird happens to contact them. A little background that adds to it all. There are three of us that live in our house. Me, my boyfriend, and our housemate. The boys had moved in in May and I started staying over a lot in June, finally moving in officially in August. Our house is in a gated development. You need to type in a code on a keypad to get in. However, you can easily slip in behind someone already going through. Same with going out. So here's what we have done. We have searched the phone number on Google and Facebook. No hits. Other people have called and texted the number with no luck. We already installed video cameras, but have now moved one to cover the driveway. My feelings? I'm actually kind of freaked out. I think there is someone in the neighborhood watching us. They didn't seem to know who was in the text messages, but they do now it seems. The handwriting looks like it's someone trying to fake a little kid writing. The R's really stand out. I'm trying to be optimistic and think it's a neighbor with really poor social skills trying to be friendly, not realizing he's being a fucking huge creeper. What do you think, RBI? If this has been said, then apologies. Have you saved the number in your phone and looked at the profile picture in WhatsApp? I do that when I get unknown calls. Most people have their face as their WhatsApp pic. Good luck. This is true. You can also put those numbers into Catch App. Venmo, PayPal, and a number of other apps to sometimes figure out the identity of an unknown caller. It's hard to say why this person is messaging the OP's boyfriend. If it was meant to be some kind of prank, it's definitely not a good one. And despite the advice from the commenters, it seems like this number still gave us no information as to who was behind it. Tucker Max is a weird thing for them to reference over and over. You say in another comment that you think they just need a photo to send, or something. But why would they need to send a photo at all with a prank text? They have to be referring to Tucker on purpose for some reason, assuming that there is any sense or logic to be gleaned from any of this. I mean, whoever it is, is going through a lot of work to make sure that your boyfriend sees this, which is weird, because the message is just essentially saying, I won't contact you again, so it makes no sense that they would copy it on physical paper. I feel like the Tucker Max references aren't random, but obviously I have no insight. I will say that sometimes very strangely ominous things that seem to be too nonsensical to just be pranks do sometimes turn out to just be pranks. Once years ago, I was getting answering machine messages that were text-to-speech robot messages of complete nonsense. 
Some of it was quite disturbing and threatening. I can't remember the whole messages anymore, but one bit I do recall was the voice saying, I'm going to shove my arm up your until you bleed sawdust. But the majority of it was too confusing to remember. I ignored it for a while because my father had over the years made a number of enemies and I assumed it was someone venting their anger at him on me. But then I finally couldn't take it anymore because the messages were starting to really worry me and I dialed the number back. A woman answered and when I told her what had been happening, she didn't sound surprised and said that she would ask her son about it. I never got another call. Why did a little boy that I didn't know call me so many times and leave me so many demented, violent, and sick messages? I'll never know. Point being, as odd and disturbing as it is, it could just be someone having a bit of fun with your boyfriend. Hopefully nothing else comes of it, but keep us updated. And almost a whole month after the OP had originally came to the RBI, we did get an update on October 1st. So first of all, for everyone's interest in my last post, a quick overview. My boyfriend got a weird text in the middle of the night back in July. There was a weird exchange between my boyfriend and the unknown texter. The unknown texter knew my boyfriend's full name, but did not know who my boyfriend was between him and our housemate. The mystery texter also sent a picture of author Tucker Max, claiming it was him asking for a picture of my boyfriend. Nothing happened after that, till middle of August. A handwritten note of the last message from that original exchange appeared one morning on my boyfriend's truck. The police were contacted, we were more aware of everything around us, and did some of our own investigating. In the end, we already were planning on moving. We just finished up moving, and I finally have time to sit down and type what's gone on in the last few days. On Wednesday night, the three of us were finishing up cleaning out the old house. I came downstairs to check on my boyfriend, and he let me know that he got a call from Tucker. It had rung three times then stopped. He didn't recognize the number at first, but then had a feeling it may have been him. So he sent a less than polite who is this text off to the number. We went back to cleaning and finished up, then went out to dinner. As we were sitting at dinner, my boyfriend's phone went off a few more times. Each time it would ring two to three times then stop. So for everyone in my last post who thought it was our roommate, that proves that it's not our roommate, as he was sitting at the table with us. Soon, it just got annoying to my boyfriend. So he said Tucker's number to auto reject. We go about finishing up packing, cleaning, and turn the keys over. Today my boyfriend remembered and checked to see if there were any more calls or texts. Here's what his call logs looked like. And what do you know? There was this text too. Who the fuck is this? Impossible, because married six years to my babelicious wife. Boy, does your fishing deal also into brand new fishing rods? because Havana and mine's old ones got thrown out when moving. Internet says, is doing good. So we're coming to, for help with brand new fishing rods. Portantly as portant, please don't move. 2123 will stay in grand condition should you keep your residence there. Below is me, yours truly. So good night, sleep tight. So here's the weird thing. My boyfriend runs his own business, Whoever this is has half of his business name right. The other half that I left should be stitching, but our Tucker got it wrong is fishing. My boyfriend followed up with the police, and that's really all to report. We're super happy to be out of that neighborhood. Luckily, the OP and their boyfriend just ended up moving away, but it is still creepy how this person knew they were getting ready to move and even looked into their business affairs. It seems as though this person had been watching them for some time and it reminds me of the Watcher story that happened in Westfield, where a couple bought a home, and soon after, they started receiving letters from a person who had been watching everything they did, eventually threatening them to move out. The identity of this person was never discovered, and eventually, the residents of the home did move out. But it seems like in the OP's case, the Watcher wants them to stay. July 23rd, 2023, Reddit user downtown Abrocama2030 came onto the RBI subreddit seeking help uncovering exactly how their dad lost their life back in 2001. What exactly happened with my dad? On January 20th of 2001, my family got the news that my dad had been found murdered hanging out of his car. 
I was pretty young, about to turn nine when it happened. So naturally, my family tried to hide everything from me. Well, here we are 22 years later, and I need answers. My family is absolutely no help. Every time I bring it up, they shut the conversation down. I have used every search function I can possibly think of and found only one article. It looks like it's from an interview that they did with my grandparents on the one year anniversary. I just need closure. Not sure about the rules, but I'll provide all of the info I have to anyone willing to help. Have you tried the police? I've contacted the police department and they have told me that the case is still technically open so they cannot give me very many details. I just went back and reread the article that I mentioned. It's been a while since I've read it, and I think I have a few new avenues to start looking down. Request the police reports. Even if they are heavily redacted, there will probably be information in it that you didn't know before. Update. With some help, I've managed to find a few more articles. I've read them and made a few notes. So far, I've been able to get the names of the suspects, how he actually died, and where he was when he died. I'm getting the police records and any other files I possibly can from the police. I've reached out to two reporters that wrote about him, and an author that writes about murders in the area. I'll keep everyone updated with any information I find out. Update number two. Well, it's really been a long day of digging and reading, and I've really found a lot out, like way more than I ever thought I would find out. I'm going to continue to call the men who were arrested suspects, because they were never found guilty, and I don't want to be that person but it appears that one of the men murdered another person back in 1994 and was charged with it in 1996. Edit. He pled guilty to manslaughter and got sentenced to three years. I'm waiting on a message back, but he might have been connected to another murder two years before my dad. If that is the case, I might have access to 88 pages of documentation. One of the men was acquitted and the other was let go due to a technicality. I've gathered that my dad was shot execution style, stabbed, and his neck slit. It also looks like he was involved in illegal narcotics. I'm meeting up with my mom tomorrow to pick my son up from spending the weekend with her. I'm going to ask her if she is maybe open to talking and giving me a few more details about the time leading up. I'll continue to keep everyone updated. Thank you for going on this journey with me. To me, it sounds like a drug deal gone wrong, but despite the circumstances, it's still sad that the OP lost their father in that way. And the fact that the OP attempted to contact these men shows just how determined they are to get this closure. I'm really sorry you don't know what happened to your father, but I just want to make a couple points that you should consider the possibility of. I saw someone else mention that there may not be any closure at the end of your search, so try to be ready for that. But also, and please keep in mind that I am not making any accusations or assumptions here, I obviously know nothing about your family or your father. I'm just trying to help you be prepared for anything. But have you considered the possibility that your father may have been involved in something dangerous or maybe even illegal? Like, could he have been involved with people doing bad things that he knew about or was a part of? Again, I'm only saying this because maybe that's the reason your family won't tell you anything about it, even all these years later. And if you are not prepared to learn something like that about your father, I could see it being devastating. So you may want to consider that before digging too deep and potentially learning something that could tarnish your memory of your father. Again, and I want to stress that I don't think this is the case and I am not trying to paint your father as a bad person, but a person murdered on the side of the road hanging out of their vehicle could have been done for any reason. So please, make sure you are prepared to learn anything, even if that's not the news you wanted to hear. I have prepared myself for anything that I may find out. I already know some things about my dad, and I know he wasn't perfect by any means. His lifestyle really could have led to his death. That is a possibility that I have prepared myself for. I just need closure. I want to understand and try to make some sense of it. I can totally understand that. I know it's a difficult position. I would want to know, but I'm not sure I would really want to know, if that makes sense. Either way, I hope you get the closure you're looking for. No matter what, everyone deserves to know what happened to their parents, if they really want it. From what I'm reading, he was probably caught up in something and ended up getting in over his head. I might end up regretting learning some of it, but there is a part to me that says, but what if you never even try to find out? I'm one of those people who would rather regret doing something than not doing it at all. The OP would give us more details in a third and fourth update. Update number three. The suspect that was released due to a technicality apparently passed away a year after he was released due to cancer. 
The other suspect I still haven't found much current info about. I decided to use the FOIL website, felony offender website for Tennessee, and have found two men with his name, but the ages don't match. I also decided last night to look up the suspect's family members and two witnesses. I happened to find their names on Facebook, but no luck. As was suggested, I went and searched the local Facebook groups, but nothing. In the article I read where my grandparents did that interview, they both mentioned that the police knew what was going to happen and just chose to ignore it. I bet they wouldn't have ignored it if it was someone important's child. Once again, just like everything else I've managed to find, this has created more questions in my head. I'm sending out requests this morning for documentation and the court transcripts from the trial where the man got acquitted. I also talked to my mom for a minute on the phone this morning and she agreed to tell me some. She says she isn't going into details because she can't handle going back there, but will answer some questions I have. I'll keep everyone updated as I get more info. Thank you for all the help and reading all of this. Small edit number four. My mom just informed me that the reason the man got acquitted was because the police had lost all of the footage from the interrogation, the wiretape that my dad apparently was wearing, and any other video slash audio evidence. I'm getting ready to start a board of some sort. This is getting to be too much to keep my head straight. With the comment about their father getting in too deep, and now with the update about them wearing a wire, I would say that maybe the OP's father got caught up and flipped to help his case. I don't believe that he was law enforcement, because if that was the case, I feel as though the family would have been more open about the circumstances instead of trying to cover this all up. This would explain why the OP's grandparents said that the police did not care, because had it been one of their own, the reaction would have been a lot different. The OP would finish off their post with a fifth update. Update 5. Probably the biggest update I have for today. I found out my family was getting death threats a few days before my dad died, as well as weeks after, and then after the man who got acquitted got released. Apparently my mom took my brother and myself out of school for like two weeks because she was terrified to let us out of her sight. I don't even remember that. Also my dad was 100% an informant. Not sure about the circumstances surrounding him becoming one yet, his handlers, or any other info. But I got the confirmation from a family friend yesterday. I'm pretty sure that the lead I thought I had was somebody trying to use me looking for answers about my dead dad to scam me. That's fine. Just because I'm desperate for answers doesn't mean I'm stupid and letting my emotions cloud my judgment. But as far as progress goes, I've talked to the records department at the police department and apparently there is a lot. They told me I could either come look through it on site or pay for copies. I'm going to be paying for the copies. Like someone in the comments said, they really showed me a lot of consideration since I was his adult child and also gave me more numbers and possible directions to start going down. After talking to my mom yesterday, she doesn't know much. She started telling me how he died and it was completely different than the info that I had found out over the last couple of days. She told me almost any info she got, she got from my grandparents or the reporter that covered my dad's case. I found two of his friends and very bluntly told them to stop trying to sugarcoat shit. I'm older now than he was when he died, to just shoot me straight. One of them is supposed to call me this afternoon. The other told me that they didn't want to go against my grandparents' wishes to keep it from me. So I got confirmation that they don't want me to know anything. I found the witnesses slash cousins of the suspect that got acquitted. However, I don't think I will be reaching out to them. I don't know if it will do any good or if it could start problems for my family who is still there. I'm trying to tread lightly as I'm still not 100% sure who we are dealing with. Unfortunately, after this we haven't gotten any new updates from the OP, but I can only imagine how they're feeling right now and can understand why they might want to take their time. To me, it seems like the OP's family wanted to keep this from them so that they would not have to deal with the trauma of how they really lost their father. It's likely that they also bear scars from that time and are clearly still hurting, but I still believe that the OP should be allowed to know everything, especially now that they're an adult. While they may have been trying to protect the OP, the OP is now old enough to where they don't need protection. Luckily, this post is very recent, so the possibility that we get a future update is very high. So until then, the story ends here. Ezekiel46 was a Redditor who came onto the RBI subreddit on January 28th of 2020 with this unsettling post. Want to find other people who came from the place I did. I'm not good at remembering things from long ago, but I'm going to try. I grew up in rural Alabama, 
Our place was a bigger house that more so looked like a barn, with a bunch of rooms put in it. The place was past the forest and near Big Cliff, and that's all I can remember from the location. I don't think we had an address, but I wouldn't have paid enough attention to see one. We weren't near any other people for probably a couple of miles. Everything was run down and falling apart. There was barely electricity and water sometimes, but even that wasn't much. A very low money area. What I always knew was that there were other places like ours, and I knew of the second, first, eleventh, ninth, and mine, which was the sixth, all in the south. I didn't know if there were any others in Alabama, but I know two of them were in Virginia and Louisiana. They had a name that sounded like Lagoon, but not quite. We weren't allowed to leave. Absolute backwards people. The other places though, I heard had it much worse, because they had an obsession with angels and the devil. Ours not as much. There was around 30 adults, and kids a little less. The kids were mean as hell to each other, and all the grown-ups did was screw. I knew the words to speak, but did not know what they meant in reading, and I couldn't write worth shit. We had to use wet paper to scrub our teeth clean. The girls used old towels when they were bleeding, but some of them just let themselves bleed. I only had two shirts and one pair of shorts, and nobody ever got their clothes clean. I didn't even know my middle, last name, or the day I was born. We got food every few days, but always had something wrong with it. That's just a few things of what it was like for us. I left in 1975 when I was 12. I went with my best friend and another girl who wanted to leave. Another kid was supposed to come too, but he disappeared behind us. I went to Virginia to find the 11th group because I've been there before. What made me want to do this is because I learned that I had a brother who died alone in one of them when he was 12. He was disabled and they hurt him. They took his mother from him because they thought he was born with horns. I want to find others like me so I can know more about where we came from and what it was like for them. Maybe even find the ones if I knew they are still here. The only good lead I got is that the one in Virginia was from Sperryville. It was hidden off, but there was a mark in a tree. When I got there, there was nothing left. I don't know what the place looks like now or if it even exists anymore. I'm not good with this stuff, so sorry if this is all messy. My wife used this site before and said it's good at helping. Thanks for everything. After reading this, my initial thoughts were that this person is describing a cult, and I believe there is a lot of truth to this user's story. They mention how they can barely write, and this is backed up by the grammar used all throughout the post. Although I did my best to make the post make sense, there seemed to be a lack of basic English writing fundamentals, and that is not to disrespect the OP or anyone who may be lacking in that department, but it adds a lot of validity to what they are saying. They even display this frustration when they say, I knew the words to speak, but didn't know what they meant in reading, and I couldn't write worth shit. Being this closed off from the world would match up with what the OP is saying, and other commenters would also feel the same. Wow. Okay, so that was a cult. That was a crazy ass cult. Further details about the structure of everyday life, religious beliefs, who the leaders were and what they told you about themselves and about you may help us narrow down which cult, Stuff like did the women cover their hair, were you kept separate from your parents, and what kind of daily activities or tasks were expected of each person. Most kids didn't have parents with them, and over the years, I've been thinking more that they might have been taken. Babies were born there, but sometimes I would just see an adult coming up with their hand around the back of a kid's neck. Maybe they were just given up, or found. I think what rules there was varied from place to place, but from what I heard about the others, I think ours was the most lax. I can't remember things about God they told us, but they had a state of mind like they were being held hostage. I couldn't tell if they believed what they were saying. They just yell all crazed and felt freaky. It was an obsession. The thing with the religion was that they had a lot of emphasis on angels. It was like they switched the roles of sin with angels. There was a woman who would fall apart at random and say she didn't want to be an angel. People would just go ballistic. I can't even begin to guess what it was about. They were paranoid all the time. They threatened us with shotguns if they found out we were in the forest, because there were angels in there. I felt like there's some symbolism in that. My dad in specific had it the worst, I think. He had this complex relationship with God, and was obsessed and afraid, but felt a hatred for him. It's hard to talk about, but he would hurt himself so badly because he was afraid of what God would take from him if he didn't. Sometimes he'd call himself the devil. I lost him to this, and after I left, I wondered if I was the devil because it all started with him after I was born. Everybody had something wrong. I was so used to it that when I started seeing the emotions of regular people, 
I didn't get them. When the women didn't dress provocatively, somebody always had something to say. The men, violent. They didn't want much from us, but when they did, you had to do it, or you would be beaten to a pulp. Sex was all the time. Everybody, even I started too early. My mom had me when she was in middle school age. Everything just felt the opposite. It didn't feel like God. What's the timeline here? How old are you now? Was it all white people? Were they tattooed? I left in 1975 when I was 12. 75? Alabama has a lot of cult history. Maybe the House of Judah? The House of Judah was a religious cult that was founded in the 1970s, created by a man named William A. Lewis, who believed he and his followers were black Hebrew Israelites. Lewis even went as far as attempting to march with the KKK, as he believed in their movement. The House of Judah had two compounds, one in Alabama and another in Michigan. Upon joining, Lewis would make his followers sign contracts agreeing to accept punishments, ranging from beatings, burnings, hangings, and even stoning whole families. The cult would punish those who tried to leave, and eventually, this reached the boiling point in 1983, when 12-year-old John Yarbo was tragically beaten to the point of losing his life. After these events, Lewis said, The kid got beaten, and he died. So to me, it's an act of God. This happened in Michigan, and the following year they relocated to Alabama. Eventually, those responsible for John's passing were tried. John's mother was sentenced to 4 to 15 years, and charged with manslaughter for allowing this to happen. Lewis and six other members were also charged for enslaving children. In all, 66 children were removed from Lewis's compound, but in a crazy turn of events, Lewis and some of the others were cleared of their charges by the state, with the defense that they were acting out of religious belief and were brainwashed. The House of Judah did disband, and Lewis later died in 2004, but the consequences of their actions still continue to affect those who now have to live with them. The OP stated that they left in 1975, when they were 12, and this cult was founded in the 1970s, but I don't necessarily know if I can say that this was the cult that they were in. The OP didn't mention when they joined the cult, but it seems as though until they left, this was the only life they knew. This to me makes the possibility of it being the House of Judah a little less likely, but does not fully rule it out. I know you said religion wasn't a huge part, but you also said the names you remember from that time are biblical. Have you looked into the 12 tribes community? They have similar beliefs about race, and children that leave their communities have similar stories. They have their own symbols as well. If they were sketched into trees, Maybe they just used Hebrew letters. See if any of these look familiar to you. They operated in Alabama and Tennessee back in the 70s, but your sect could have been an offshoot, someone trying to start their own 12 tribes branch. Founded in 1972 by a man named Albert Eugene Spriggs, the 12 tribes cult was another group based in the southern United States, primarily in Tennessee, but had locations in Georgia and Alabama as well, with many of the churches they opened. They would also open up a restaurant, notoriously known as the Yellow Deli. This was likely another way to siphon more money from their church members, like the House of Judah. This group also physically abused its members and was also accused of child slavery. The religious cult 12 Tribes. Former members say it heavily disciplines children, lacks medical care and tears families apart. They were originally founded in Chattanooga, but had to relocate due to the constant controversies they found themselves in. In 2006, the original members had a reunion, and in 2008, the group returned to Chattanooga and opened up a new Yellow Deli location, back in the city where it all began. The founder, Albert Spriggs, passed away on January 11th of 2021, but the group appears to still be active with branches in Canada, Australia, Brazil, Spain, and Germany, with their German location being raided by the German authorities on October of 2013, where they removed 40 children who were being abused by the cult members. The 12 tribes was founded three years before the OP left their group, so like the House of Judah, it's in the time frame, but may have been formed later than the group the OP was in. The cult is based on the First Testament, 
The 12 tribes live in communities, handing over all their possessions and all their money when they join. God-given right. They recruit members through their Yellow Deli cafes around the world, but it's their treatment of children that has sparked international headlines. How old are you? You tell her. This hidden camera investigation aired on US television in 2018, filming young children of the 12 tribes being forced to work on their farms and on factory assembly lines. Factories? We don't have factories. We have videotape of it, yeah. sir. We didn't say you couldn't go to the hospital, but it had to get to a point of urgency where there's some danger. I know of a girl who almost died. And um, by the time they got her there and they got her a blood transfusion, she was nearly gone. Reading your descriptions makes me wonder if this was more of a homeless camp than a cult. Especially the mention of talk of other places and markers in the trees to find their location. Definitely seems so. Rural Alabama is hard to pinpoint. Today, many homeless camps have been set up in actual state-run parks, but there are many that just live in the woods. Alabama has some wealthier areas, but those severely affected by terrible poverty still create camps. I'm sorry this was your childhood. If it brings you comfort, just know that those adults had the mentality of children themselves. They did the best they could with the resources they had. They shared their food, and I'm sure provided some warmth during the winter. It doesn't sound like they meant you harm. They lived more like a tribe. They kept to themselves because they weren't living by the state of Alabama's rules. Chances are, the police knew about the camp and left you all alone. There's enough poverty to not enforce rules about children going to schools and such. It doesn't sound like they were religious in any real sense. You knew of other camps because they probably traded ideas with those camps about getting food and supplies. Maximum camp size would probably be around 50 women, men, and children combined. That's all about any tribe can handle. They were probably getting handouts from locals, dumpster diving, or relatives who had jobs. Yes. I think it was more of being homeless than a cult now that I think about it. There were some shared mental problems with religion, but it wasn't so organized to be like that. Maybe belief just spread and made things bad. I wish things could have been better, and I want to be an assurance to anyone left that God isn't cruel like that. I tried to find more information about the OP's group in order to try to narrow down the cult possibilities but I wasn't really able to find anything other than the really poor living conditions. If this group was a homeless camp, it could explain the OP's lack of education growing up, as well as the members' obsession with God. As unfortunately, drug use can be common in these homeless communities, and people experiencing drug-induced mental health episodes can sometimes become obsessed with God and other spiritual entities. Regardless of what the situation was, I am happy that the OP was able to make it out of there. Cults are constantly evolving, growing, and trying to avoid detection. So if this was a cult, and they haven't disbanded yet, it is possible they could have changed their name by now, as well as their location. Nervous Craft LALA -LA, came to the RBI on January 12th of 2023, seeking information on an event that has haunted them since they were a child. Witnessed the death of a neighbor as a child about 45 to 50 years ago, trying to find out info about it. Trigger warning. Graphic violence. I've covered it with a spoiler block. Back when I was a kid living in New Orleans, I saw somebody die in the street with their throat cut. It's a long story, but these are the bullet points. We lived in Holly Grove, a neighborhood of New Orleans, 2936 Joliet Street to be exact. The approximate timeline was 1974, 1975, or maybe 1976, but I doubt it was in 76. I was either in third or fourth grade, and that would have put it at fall of 1973 spring, 1975 school year's timeline. My neighbor's first name was Margaret. She did it in self-defense. He was assaulting her with a screwdriver, and she grabbed a kitchen knife and slashed at him. He stumbled into the street and my father ran out to see if he could help. I followed and watched him pass in the street. This has affected me a lot in my adult years. It's constant fight or flight in my life, but the weird part is, no one else in the family remembers it, except for my dad who never wanted to discuss it, and he's passed away since then. My mom claims that it never happened. What? I was freaking eight to nine years old and watched the man lay in the street as he lost his life and that never happened? 
Miss Margaret's sons were so nice and my good friends. I never heard from them again after this, and would love to see if I can find them somehow and see how they are. Of course I wouldn't bring this up. I've looked in New Orleans newspaper archives for this time, and can't find anything. It's understandable why this stuck with the OP for so long. I mean, this event would traumatize an adult, let alone a child. You may want to try the New Orleans Parish Library. I've gotten lots of help from my local library online. Also, sorry you had to witness that. Thank you. I can't believe it's been so long, and I can still see his face clear as day. I never thought about going to the library. Thank you. I've only done online archive searches, looked in crime report sections during those three years, and haven't found a thing. I mean, wouldn't that be newsworthy? A woman killing someone in self-defense? We lived in a shotgun house, and I heard all the screaming. A horrible memory I'd like to erase. I just want closure, even if it is to confirm that this all happened. I can't believe my mom doesn't remember. Luckily, a user by the name Smudget would quickly find a news article that featured the event. Found an article in the Louisiana Weekly newspaper from December 1st, 1973. Can see the picture of the article here. Oh my god, this is it. I can't believe it. After so long searching and searching, I'm overwhelmed, thank you. This is the article Smudget linked. One of these took place on the evening prior to Thanksgiving, when a 19-year-old youth was stabbed to death in his home at 2934 Joliet Street. Police say that Margaret Ann Martin, 26, returned home to find her cousin Arthur King had not completed the work he was to have completed during the day. An argument ensued, and according to police sources, during the course of the conflict, King began to swing at his cousin with a screwdriver. Reports say that Miss Martin then produced a steak knife in which she stabbed King in the upper chest area, fatally wounding him. King was pronounced dead at the scene. Miss Martin was taken to Central Lockup, where she was charged with murder. In a later update, the OP would give us more information. I want to thank everyone for their help from the bottom of my heart. User Smudget, your discovery helped me so much. I'm so grateful. I was able to show it to my mother who indeed hadn't remembered it. She was stunned. The address listed was the kicker. It confirmed that this was indeed Miss Margaret and her cousin. I don't remember my mom being involved in the situation like my father and I were. She stayed in the house with my little sister and brother. I'm posting the story and blocking some parts for violence. This is what happened. It was late. I know it was around 10 or 10.30 p.m. I had already drifted to sleep, but then I was awakened by loud talking on the other side of the wall. The talking turned to screaming and shouting. A loud argument. I've always been a bit anxious about arguing, so I went to my parents' bedroom, woke up my dad, and said I was scared because of the shouting. My dad scolded me and said to go back to sleep, that it was a school night and I shouldn't be up, and to mind my own business. I reluctantly went back to bed, with the shouting and arguing continuing next door. I thought about my friends, her sons, that had to be just as anxious as me listening to that. After about two to three minutes, the shouting escalated into horrible screaming and shrieking. I was shaking, starting to cry. I want a new life, I heard the man shouting. I heard Miss Margaret screaming at the top of her lungs. Then he screamed too, and I heard him running up the hall to the front door. I scuttled over to the living room window and saw him lurching across the front porch. It was dark, but I could see that he was not okay. By this time, my dad got up as well and was standing at the front door. He ran out to the street where Arthur had stumbled to. I was shocked that my dad was outside in his underwear. I followed my dad who was crouched over him, and I looked over his shoulder. I saw Arthur's eyes roll back into his head. Oh my god, my dad said. He's dead. He's dead. I watched. Fascinated and horrified, I didn't understand the finality of what I had just seen. Miss Margaret was behind us, standing on the cement porch, in a stained white shirt. The back of her shirt showed her puncture wounds, and she was screaming that he tried to kill her with a screwdriver. New Orleans PD arrived and took her away. My two friends, her sons, came to our house and sat on the living room sofa, quiet and in shock. My dad told me to go to sleep, that someone in their family was going to pick them up. But I couldn't sleep, and watched them from down the hall as they huddled together on our couch. I finally went to sleep, and I never heard from them again. I didn't go to school the next day, and I kept going to the spot in the street where Arthur had died. I said some awkward kids' prayers for him, 
And later that day, it rained and washed everything away. That memory has lived in my mind since. I'm restarting therapy and will do the EMDR process. There is a lot more that has contributed to PTSD in my life, but as you can imagine, this moment created so many triggering behaviors. Again, thanks so much to y'all. Take care. The saddest part of this story to me is when the OP mentions the fact that their friends, the sons of Miss Margaret, went into their house after this happened. And while this did traumatize the OP, we can only imagine the impact it had on those two boys. The article cut off at the part where Miss Margaret was charged with murder, but luckily, on the Best of Redditors update subreddit, one user found the comment made by Perfect Rasmataz, who was able to find out more information on what happened to Miss Margaret after this event took place. User Perfect Rasmataz was able to find some information about Margaret and wrote this comment further down the thread, adding it here so it doesn't get lost. So I was able to track Margaret down through records on Ancestry.com. Not sure what all I'm able to post, as I'm not sure all of the rules of this sub, but she's still alive and was living in St. James Parish, Louisiana, as late as 2020. She's married and has a different last name now. Not sure if she ended up being imprisoned or not, but there are records of her living at various non-prison addresses around New Orleans in the 1980s, so she certainly was a free woman then and now. This was another example of how quickly things can escalate to a point of no return, and how events like these can leave lasting psychological effects on a person, even if they're not directly involved. Once again, the Reddit Bureau of Investigation solves another case. Nervy Rocks was a Redditor whose sister had recently broken up with her now ex-boyfriend of seven years. Only instead of taking her belongings hostage or showing up uninvited, he did something different. Sister's ex planted 12 plus jars of almond butter around the apartment they used to share. Please forgive me if there is a better sub to post this, but I'm kind of worried and completely at a loss for what could be going on. Some backstory, my sister recently ended her seven year relationship with a man who was seemingly not vicious or harmful in any way. He's a 30 something man of Spanish descent. She left their apartment and when she returned, she found out that he had moved without saying anything about it two weeks prior. When she started to go through things and cleaning, she started to find unopened jars of almond butter with the number 7 written on the lid in Sharpie, she's still finding them in a myriad of places. So far, she's found around 12, one in each window, in an empty can of breadcrumbs in the kitchen cabinet above the stove, in an empty baby wipes container under the bathroom sink, in the cabinet above the kitchen sink, in between towels, in a pile of her clothes, in one of his nightstand drawers, two under the bed, one under his side, and one directly in the middle and one in her specific chair that she sits in. The one in the nightstand drawer was the only one that was opened and did not have a number seven written on the lid and there was some scooped out. She has no contact with him and doesn't really want to contact him about this, but I'm getting worried. It was obviously done on purpose. Is he just messing with her trying to waste her time or is this some attempt at Santeria or a spell or something else involving the occult? I'm not making assumptions but that did pop into my mind considering the numerology aspect and the weirdness of it all. Also, it's organic and $10 a jar. He isn't a wealthy person by any means, so it obviously wasn't nothing. Neither of them even eat almond butter. If anyone has any sort of clue or even a guess as to what's going on, please help. The OP mentions Santeria, which in short, is a religious practice that revolves around witchcraft. And while I would say that this is weird, I really don't think that anything occult is happening but other Redditors would disagree. This kind of reminds me of this post on r slash occult. There's a guy planting rocks in different states. The rocks are supposed to be like some sort of energy map, so they are laid out across a wide area to encompass a specific place. However, I don't think you will find anything specific on this, even if it is witchcraft, because spells like this tend to be unique to the person. You should just ask him. Maybe not you or your sister, but I'm sure they have a mutual friend. This is the post that the commenter is talking about. I'm placing 33 stones in 33 US states within 333 days, a power ritual to King Paimon. This is my 26th place stone placed in Casey, Iowa. Info in the comments. In the comments, they do give more information about this ritual and even includes a link to a comic book 
that explains the beliefs behind this ritual. I'm not gonna lie to you and tell you that I read the whole thing, because honestly, it was too much, even by my standards. But it does feature instructions on meditation, magic, lucid dreaming, and astral projection. Aside from the comic book, this user also mentions that they're doing this ritual in response to two people who have contacted CPS on him and his wife, who is suffering from cancer. They allege that they are being accused of abandoning their children, so they are doing this ritual to combat these people. Two people spread vicious rumors that I had abandoned my wife and children, called CPS services, and then claimed they were going to personally adopt our children. In a later update, the 33 days to completely neutralize the two individuals involved are up. The one who was close friends with my wife lost her job. She was last seen mowing her own and her neighbor's yard to have her rent reduced by her landlord. She was somehow caught cutting people's pay and stealing hours to her own paycheck. The second individual involved deleted her Facebook, reported to mutual friends that she was backing down from her CPS threat, and was now scared. This person has inherited money years ago and fancies herself as a crusader for rescuing young girls. She volunteers and tips off child services. She apparently had a room in her house ready to adopt my daughters. She was gracious, but has receded further from public view. They even mentioned that they are attempting to contact Paimon, which if you've watched the movie Hereditary, you might know who this is. It's said that Paimon is one of the kings of hell who directly serves Lucifer, and by summoning him, they have been able to enact their revenge on these people. The whole post is a good read, so I'll also include it in the description. But like I said, I don't think this has anything to do with the almond jars, or the occult for that matter. Now back to the post, where the OP did provide us with two updates. Update. I didn't think I would get this many responses. I think I'm mostly through all of them. So firstly, thank you to everyone who chimed in, and for all the well wishes. I appreciated every comment. Second, it feels like there are a few different opinions that people have brought up. One, possible signs of mental illness. Two, he was drunk and or just messing with her, trying to get her to read into it and maybe hoping she would contact him about it. And three, there are mentions of almond oil slash almonds in religious and occult-based practices. So many people chimed in with, but witchcraft and the occult aren't real. While I respect your opinion, and while I thank you for sharing, in my opinion, that doesn't matter. There are so many people who do believe in it wholeheartedly that it only matters if he believes it would work. If he believes this will work, and is trying to influence or control her life slash emotions and fate, it is very possible that when his spell doesn't come to fruition, he won't take it into his own hands and possibly step it up to something more dangerous. That isn't out of the question for me, especially if he's heartbroken, scorned, or even willing to try to get anything back, which makes sense considering the terms of their breakup. There are also a few things worth mentioning. He knows that while my sister doesn't believe in witchcraft per se, she is a believer of some new agey things, and this wouldn't be far from her wheelhouse. He has also been a very long-term alcoholic. Not dangerous. Not even when blackout drunk. Doesn't mean he couldn't start now though. Update 2. I asked for a floor plan and made a quick and easy one for you guys. I also included the only pics my sister sent me. Included was this picture of the apartment floor plan, labeled with the locations of where they found the jar, as well as the images of the jars themselves. Honestly, to me it just seems like more of a prank than some ritual and I really don't understand where all this occult stuff is coming from. But in an update almost a whole month later, the OP would finally give us an answer. So sorry it took so long to post an official update. Sadly, for us mystery lovers, it was a very simple explanation. I straight up asked him, and he told me it was just a joke. He said he was gifted a case of the expensive jars of almond butter, and thought it would be funny to plant them around the apartment when he moved out. I did also ask him if the reason for the hole in the only opened one was because he stuck his junk in it. He said no, but he had thought about doing it. He's a strange one. Thank you for all of your interest, guesses, and research. Definitely one of the weirdest breakups I've ever heard about, but thankfully not one of the worst. In all, it is a pretty harmless prank. And now the OP's sister has a huge supply of almond butter, which I would gladly take over a Stalker X any day. That's all for this video. Let me know your thoughts, theories, or any video suggestions down in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching.